are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is the true story of Stacey Castor, the Black Widow killer. Now, this one seems like it could only be a fictional lifetime movie. However, it's a true story, and they're now turning it into a lifetime movie. There were several deaths, attempted murder, a confession, and a suicide note, and so much more. By the way, I post so much content like this. It's my absolute passion to tell these victim stories, and I mean no harm when I do so. I really do want to spread the light to their cases and spread awareness to them and their life story and what happened to them. And if I can do so to all of you, that makes me so incredibly happy. So if you'd like to be a part of that, all you have to do is subscribe, maybe thumbs up this video, leave a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2005 in New York and the Castor family lived in Weedsport, Onaganda County. This consisted of Stacy and David Castor, which were the mother and stepfather of two children that was 18-year-old Ashley and 14-year-old Bree. Now these two girls, their father had actually passed away five years prior from a heart attack and in 2003, that is when Stacy and David Castor met. They had met through a mutual friend and they began to work together and it was an instant connection. Stacy worked at David's family-owned business which was a heating and cooling company. She worked in the office. He was of course the overall manager of it all and David had been married previously so he was also a divorcee and he had one son from that marriage who was David Jr. who was already grown and out of the house at this point and David was a pretty responsible businessman. He had, he made good money. He was also adventurous and they spent a lot of time together. He didn't party at all, which is something that Stacy's previous husband had done. So it was kind of nice and refreshing for her to have this kind of responsible man in her life now. This is when Stacy would introduce David to her daughters, Ashley and Bree. And this bond didn't occur immediately. I mean, the girls didn't really like him. He said he didn't need any more kids. He had already raised one and he wasn't really interested in raising any more. And so they pretty much got through two years as a more dysfunctional family who just kind of lived together, but not really as a family. And it was then 2005 and Ashley would be graduating from high school. And this is when her and David began to really have more of a father-daughter relationship, more of kind of a friend relationship than even that. And he went to her graduation. He was very proud of her and they really began to bond a little bit more at that point than they ever had before. But on August 22nd, a call was placed to the police department in the area at about 2 p.m. that day. And it was from Stacy. She had called from her work, which was David's business-owned company, and she had asked for a welfare check at her home. She said that her husband David hadn't showed up to work that day and the previous weekend, he hadn't really come out of his bedroom and she tried to call him. She tried to knock on the door and he wasn't letting her in. He wasn't coming out and she was just worried about him. Stacy claimed that David was very depressed, that he also had a gun and that they had had a fight previous to him going in the room about their anniversary. It was supposed to be their second anniversary. They were going to go to an amusement park, but they didn't have anywhere for the youngest daughter, Bree, to go. And so they were fighting over this. And eventually David just grabbed a bottle of alcohol and went to the bedroom and didn't come out. Now, Stacy said she'd gone in a few times to give him stuff. He had also came out at one point for a little while, but she hadn't seen him all that much that weekend at all. When the officer gets there, he listens through the door and can hear some sort of entertainment, such as like radio and TV playing. So he calls out for David and David doesn't answer. So at this point, he has to knock in the door to make sure David's okay. And when they open the door, they realize that David was not. He was lying face down on the bed, naked in a pool of vomit, and there were glasses everywhere. There was cranberry juice, apricot brandy, and a bottle of 
antifreeze. And if that wasn't disturbing enough to just find the bottle, there was actually a cup with a bright green substance halfway full on the nightstand. At this point, Stacy had arrived at the home and she began to shout saying, he's not dead, he's not dead. And this, their stepfather's death affected everyone in the family greatly, even the girls who weren't that close to him because this was paralleling to their father's death. I mean, he died of a heart attack, but going through that traumatic thing when they were so young and then going through it again, this would have just triggered them, especially if they hadn't had any sort of grief counseling for it. I mean, this would have truly just sent them back to the place they were in when their own father died. And Ashley, the oldest, even wrote a letter to her friend at this point saying that she was thinking of hurting herself. When David's body was brought in for an autopsy, the coroner found that the cause of death was suicide through a self-administered lethal dose of antifreeze, and this would have been an open and shut case, right? Well, we all knew that that was not where this was going. The investigators had gone to the caster home just to eliminate any sign of foul play. And that's when they found something very strange. You see, there was a turkey baster in the trash can, which was a very strange thing to just have and to have in a trash can. And so they brought this as well as all the glasses on the nightstand in for testing. And from that, they would find DNA of David on the tip of this turkey baster and also on the antifreeze as well. Stacy's fingerprints was also on the antifreeze and investigators were very, very suspicious at this point because the turkey baster was in the trash can in the kitchen, meaning he would have had to come out and place it in the kitchen after using it on himself and his DNA was only found on the end, not the top where he would have had to squeeze it. And why would he have used that if he had a bottle that could have been easily poured into the cup like it was. His will was then examined after he passed and you guessed it, Stacy got everything. Even though David had a son that he was close to, especially prior to David's marriage to Stacy. Thankfully, the police didn't ignore all of this. They became very suspicious. They decided to tap all of her phones to catch her in a lie, possibly a confession. They also posted cameras outside of her home and also at the grave site because she had buried David next to her previous husband. So both of her deceased husbands were next to each other. So the police put cameras up there thinking that a grieving widow, if she really cared about her husband, would go to his gravesite. However, this doesn't necessarily prove that she's guilty or not. If she goes, I mean, people grieve in different ways. Possibly she wasn't ready to go see his grave. A lot of people don't ever do so because they can't handle it and has nothing to do with whether they're guilty or not. On the other hand, Stacy could have just gone if she was a manipulative, lying person. She could have just gone to make it look like she cared, but she didn't end up going and Stacy then told investigators that that weekend nobody had really been home with David because she had sent the girls away to friends because David was acting this way. She also went to a friend's as well to get away from him. She said she called him several times, but there was actually no phone records of this. She called him one time right before she called the police to go over and do a welfare check. Investigators started to believe that these weren't all coincidences and that they were in fact evidence of murder. Now they believed that Stacy had used the turkey baster to force feed David this antifreeze to kill him when he was too drunk to stop her. They also began to believe that this was not Stacy's first kill. I mean, two husbands dead in the matter of five years? The only problem with this was that Stacy's first husband, Mike Wallace, had died of a heart attack, right? Well, he hadn't officially had an autopsy. You see, Stacy and her first husband, Mike Wallace, had met in 1985 when Stacy was just 17. They were actually at a bar and Mike's friends had dared him to go and get Stacy and to see if he could take her home that night and he did and after this they were pretty much inseparable. I mean, Mike kind of had a more adventurous, spontaneous, wild side 
and Stacy, being 17, absolutely loved this. They got married and three years after would have their first daughter, Ashley. Four years after that would have their second daughter, Brie, and they were really a super happy family at this point. I mean, Mike had finally calmed down his crazy lifestyle to be more family oriented. He worked at McQuay, Stacy worked at a billing office. They would often go as a family on drives around town just to do something that wouldn't cost a lot of money and the girls really loved to do this. Mike was closer to Bree, Stacy was closer to Ashley and that often happens in families. You know, kids are closer to one parent or the other, but it was pretty equal and they had a life that they dreamed of. I mean, they weren't wealthy by any means. They weren't well off, but they were surrounded by those they loved and that's all that matters sometimes. In 1999, however, Mike started showing signs of being ill on and off. He was very unsteady. He would cough all the time. He was swollen at times and his family members began to tell him he needed to go see a doctor, but he never did. And before he could do so, on January 11th, 2000, Ashley, his oldest, found him. She was 12 at the time. She came home from school. He was kind of stretched out on the couch making funny faces. She had to go pick up her daughter or her sister, Bree, from school. And so she called her mother, not thinking that it was anything too crazy, just to tell her that her father was making funny faces, she didn't know what to do, and so Stacy rushed home. When the ambulance got there, David still had a heartbeat, but unfortunately that would stop in the ambulance and he would pass. Now, Ashley blamed herself for this, even being so young, because she had been the only one with him that day, and she didn't know that it meant, the funny faces meant that he couldn't breathe. Doctors said that it was definitely a heart attack and asked if Stacy still wanted to do an autopsy, even though they knew this, and she said no, it wasn't necessary. But Mike's sister was very suspicious of this and said, no, I want an autopsy, and Stacy refused, and because she was his wife, it wasn't done and he would be put in the grave without having an autopsy. Now, after this, Stacy took the girls to Disneyland to get their mind off of what had just happened to their father and that is when she became a single mother. However, a few years later, a mutual friend would put her in contact with David Castor and that was when she would start working at his family company and they would soon fall in love. Everything was going well for a while until Stacy began to get angry at him because he would leave her at the office to do work while he would go and do fun, adventurous things. And he allegedly wasn't paying any of the actual bills. He was just paying stuff for himself, leaving Stacy to still provide for her and her daughters and the home and everything by herself. So a lot of the fights started to occur because of that and the anniversary fight was just the cherry on top. Now after David's death, the Castor family moved on. Stacy became very distant towards her girls who pretty much had to provide for themselves after this, but little did they know the police were still investigating David's death. Family and friends of David's, even his ex-wife, was saying he would have never taken his life. That just was not like him. However, mental health can really be a silent struggle, and so we don't really know. Stacy, at this point, had gotten everything from David, including the family business, which Stacy then sold all of it. And it would have taken a year to get back the DNA evidence from the Castor home, from the turkey baster and the antifreeze and all of that. So after the year when they found Stacy's fingerprints on the antifreeze, they decided that if David's death was a murder, Mike's probably was as well. So that is when they decided to exhume his body. In 2007, Mike Wallace's body would be exhumed to do a autopsy for the first time and a toxicology screening would come back saying that it in fact was not a heart attack. It was antifreeze poisoning, just like David Castor. Two days later, investigators would go over to Castor's home to speak with Stacy. They told her that they just needed to fill out some paperwork to finish David's case, that nothing was happening. She just needed to come down to the station to talk to them for a bit. 
But in the investigation, into the interrogation, Stacy began to realize what was actually happening, but this didn't really stop her from talking because she would go on to say that she believed that David actually got the idea to poison himself from a TV show they'd been watching together that was about a woman who poisoned two of her husbands. She poisoned them with antifree. And no, I didn't say that wrong. Stacy called it Anna Free, not Anna Freeze, which will come into play later in the story. After this, they let Stacy go, thinking that she would make a call to somebody that she would confess, saying that she was nervous that they were going to catch her. But this didn't actually happen. She called a friend and said she was nervous because she didn't do it. So I wonder if she knew that her phone was tapped. On September 12th, investigators would actually go and speak to Ashley, the oldest daughter, and she was actually at her first day of college at Bryant and Stratton, and investigators would go up to her and say that her stepfather's death was not just simply an overdose or a suicide, and also that her own father's death was not a heart attack, that they had both been murdered. She was completely shocked. She was angry at investigators because they were, of course, blaming her mother. She didn't believe this at all. She was so angry. She actually believed that they didn't know who else to blame, so they were just blaming her mother. But two days later, an ambulance would be called to the Castor home once again. A suicide note was thought to be found. Stacy said on this call, My daughter is taking throat. She sounds like there's something in her throat. Ashley. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. When the ambulance got there, Ashley was unresponsive. And inside the home, they found an empty bottle of vodka and four empty pill bottles. Now, Stacy handed the investigators the suicide note that Brie had found next to Ashley. Brie was actually the one that found her older sister and she was laying across her bed with pillows across her face and there was this note next to her body. Brie would say that her mother didn't actually seem too panicked about this, so she wasn't too panicked about this, but she didn't know how bad it really was. Now, this suicide note was much more than just that. On the inside, it was rambling about how Ashley loved her mother and that it wasn't her fault. And then Ashley began to confess to the murder of her father and her stepfather, saying in detail how she did it and that that's why she was taking her life and that she didn't want her mother to go to jail for something she hadn't done. This was a typed note with a typed signature so they couldn't compare handwriting. Now. They had no idea if Ashley would actually even survive this. She was taken to the hospital and she actually did wake up a few hours later and as soon as she did, the cops were on top of her asking her information, asking her about the note about killing her fathers and Ashley was so confused and finally her sister Bree came up to her and said, you wrote a suicide note saying that you killed our dads. Did you write that? And. Ashley was so confused. She said, what note are you talking about? I, I didn't try to kill myself. I didn't write a note. She was so genuinely confused. When investigators finally got to talk to Ashley, when she was calmed down, she said the last thing she remembered was calling her mother after the investigators had come to talk to her, calling her mother and saying what the investigators had said, that they were blaming her mother and that she didn't know what to do. And her mom actually invited her home saying that there had been a stressful week, a stressful time, and that they just needed to have a drink together. So they did. Then the next morning before noon, when they woke up, her mom said, we should drink again. And Ashley was like, before noon? And her mom said, oh yeah, by the time we get everything ready, it'll be afternoon. But it wasn't. And they started to drink. And it was vodka with Sprite in it, and Ashley said it tasted really nasty. She told her mom this, and her mom just said, oh, stir it up. It's the Sprite. It'll make it taste better. So she continued to drink. Ashley drank the rest and then fell asleep at around 1.30, and the next time she woke up with was in the hospital where they said that a fatal dose of painkillers was in Ashley's system, and if she had been brought to the hospital even a minute later, she wouldn't have survived. Where was Ashley's worried mother at this time when she was in the hospital? She was in the parking lot, smoking a cigarette. Now, she would be arrested at this point in the parking lot, and her trial would be in February of 2009 for the murder of David Castor. 
in the attempted murder of Ashley Wallace. Now, the first witness called was Ashley Wallace herself, and the defense claimed that Ashley was suicidal before, that she had been there when both her fathers had passed away, and that she also wasn't close to them either. Now, the prosecution claimed that Stacy forged that suicide note, which is why it was typed. And also, she had done the same thing with David's will. On the stand, Ashley denied killing her father, her stepfather, or trying to take her life. She said that the note was not written by her and she wasn't even home that weekend when David passed away. It had been found that this note had been typed in the Castor home the day prior to Ashley's overdose and it had been from 8 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. and these were time stamped on the computer. However, Ashley at this time was at school in class. She couldn't have been at home typing this note. However, because Stacy's phones were tapped, you could hear in the background what she was doing at this time, and you could hear the clicking from the keyboard. Now, this is when Stacy took the stand, and something that is always so telling to me is body language, and Stacy was extremely rigid and emotionless, and when her husband's death and her daughter's near-death experience were spoken about, she was completely emotionless showing nothing. Now, when they would ask her questions and she would respond with no, she would shake her head yes without even realizing it. The attorneys were practically yelling at Stacy to try to get her to show any sort of emotion and it just wasn't happening. However, something huge that Stacy messed up on is that in the note that was allegedly written by Ashley, there had been written a word in there several times. The word Anna Free. Something that they knew that Stacy said instead of Anna Freeze. However, you could say that Ashley just adopted her mother's dialect, but with all the other evidence, it really seemed to just be stacking up against Stacy, even though Stacy continued to say it was her daughter. After two days of deliberation on March 5th, Stacy Castor would be found guilty of second degree murder of David Castor and second degree attempted murder of Ashley Wallace and would get 51 years without parole. Her daughters would then make a statement that actually broke my heart. Ashley was saying that she was stronger because of this, that she was a survivor, she was a fighter, and that basically she would continue on with her life even though she was so heartbroken that her mother would have done this. I never knew what hate was until now. As horrible as it makes me feel, this is goodbye, Mom. As hard as you tried, I survived, and I will survive because now I'm surrounded by people that love me. Bree said that she was happy that her mother could no longer hurt them anymore. And both Mike Wallace and David Castor's families are working to change the law to make it mandatory to have autopsies done because... It, if David Castor wouldn't have been murdered by Stacy, Mike would have never been found to have been murdered either. But in another twist, Stacy's actually currently being looked into for another murder of her father, Jerry Daniels, who in 2002 passed away. According to the Generation Y podcast, he was actually in the hospital for a lung issue and he was visited by Stacy, who had a can of soda in her hand when he went when she went in. He was completely fine at that point, and then the next day, he just died suddenly. And guess who would benefit from that? Stacy, who got his estate. What's awful is that Stacy's family, specifically her parents, believed her. She had gotten them so wrapped around her finger. She had manipulated them so much that they truly believed that it was not their daughter, but their granddaughter who did it. And they were okay with blaming her. Now, there is something that I want to mention that I heard a lot in the research for this case. And although I want to preface this saying that I do wholeheartedly believe that Ashley and Bree are completely innocent in this whole scenario, I mean... I've looked deeply into this case and I truly do think that they just had a horrific mother who treated them horribly and did horrible things and tried to blame them. But one of the main things that people were saying before they got to the point where it proved that Stacy was the guilty one, they were saying, it couldn't be Ashley. She was only 12. She couldn't have poisoned her father. And 
this really irks me because we talk about so many child killers on this channel so we know that age doesn't equal innocence but a lot of people were saying because it was poison she couldn't have done it however in the case that we've talked about before of marie robards which i will link down below that we've talked about before she was a 16 year old that poisoned her father with something that she got from school so obviously it's something that if there's a will there's a way they're going to figure out how to do it and just because in this case it didn't happen to be ashley doesn't mean that that is right to say just because she's 12 she couldn't have done that the fact that so many professionals were ruling ashley out because she was a child just shows how little they know about child killers and how much they want to think that that's not possible and that's why I want to inform you. On June 11th, 2016, Stacey Castor would actually be found dead in her cell and it was first listed as undetermined but it, then it was found to be a heart attack and Stacey actually had two teddy bear tattoos of little angel teddy bears sitting on a cloud for each of her deceased husbands. She was also to be buried right next to David and Mike her husband she had murdered and also next to her father who she possibly murdered as well. Thankfully David's grave has since been moved away and a new tombstone had been made because Stacy's name was on both of their tombstones. It was said Stacy wanted people to believe that her life had been crippled by tragedy, that her first husband had died of a heart attack, her second husband had died of poisoning himself with antifreeze, and that her daughter had also attempted suicide. Now you may be wondering why she was named the Black Widow Killer. And this is something I actually learned from the Female Criminals podcast and that is that a Black Widow is a very venomous spider that is known for killing and after mating especially female Black Widows will devour their males because they simply don't think that they are useful anymore and think it'd be better to just eat them. And it was said that Stacy kind of feels the same way once she gets to a certain point where her husbands can't do anything else for her. She murders them to get even more out of them as far as like life insurance, their will, everything like that. It was said that Stacy was a cold and calculating human without any emotion for what she has done. Stacy Castor places no value on human life, not even her own flesh and blood. To Stacy Castor, human beings are disposable. Now she didn't even ever apologize to her girls for what she had put them through, didn't even talk to them. This case has been done on 2020 Dateline Forensic Files and there will be a fictional reconstruction of this case on Lifetime here pretty soon. In fact, I'm really excited for it and no, this isn't sponsored, although how cool would it be to be sponsored by a Lifetime movie? But in the future, I'm super excited to see how they will present this case and how much of it will be fiction versus reality. So yeah, look out for that. I will try to let you guys know either on Twitter or on Instagram or maybe in the community tab here on YouTube when that comes out. But I just wanted to tell you guys this case because I thought it was an absolute crazy one. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.